The CEO of Delta Airlines tells me this summer will be gangbusters for domestic flying within the United States. The post-pandemic international travel boom will likely have to wait until 2022. Ed Bastian says 12 months ago he wasn't sure Delta would survive the COVID crisis at all. Now the U.S. carriers are finally able to breathe. This is the moment that airlines have been waiting for. The vaccine rollout, and with it, the shot in the arm for air travel. As restrictions are being lifted across the United States, passenger numbers are at their highest since the pandemic began. It's all spark talk of a summer boom. This summer is going to be really a, a comeback for travel. For Delta Airlines, the future's looking much brighter. It's no longer burning through cash, and it's hoping to start rehiring new staff. It's even selling middle seats again, the last of the U.S. carriers to do so. The chief executive, Ed Bastian, says its focus on COVID safety has paid dividends. So people are prioritizing, as they should, uh, their health and safety and comfort as they travel. And we're getting a, a mean, meaningful premium for travel on Delta. The last piece of the puzzle is international flights. Many of those lucrative overseas routes can't return until countries lift travel limits or agree some sort of vaccine passport. <sighs> As Delta and other airlines call for a transatlantic travel corridor, industry leaders say coordination is the key. We're looking at a global industry, and it's no good unless all parts of that industry are working in tandem. It's been a painful time for Delta and the entire aviation sector. Passenger traffic at Delta's Atlanta hub fell 60% this year. Now, as flyers return, the industry has something to cling on to. Hope. Now, airlines on both sides of the Atlantic are pushing the US and UK governments to get that vital travel corridor up and running as soon as possible. I spoke exclusively to Ed Bastian at Delta's Flight Museum in Atlanta, where he told me they believe the health risks are now extremely low. Hopefully, we can get that corridor open for the summer. Uh, we know the medical evidence and the documentation with respect to where the vaccination rates are for both our countries in the U.S. and the U.K., where the infection rates of our countries indicate that it's extraordinarily low risk to travel between the U.S. and the, the U.K., provided you're vaccinated. Or you can produce a test to show that you're clean on board that flight. In fact, the Mayo Clinic, who we've worked with, has put that risk at one in five million. So how important is it? Because the domestic market is opening up at a fair old pace. Yeah. How important is it to open up the UK market? Well, the UK is the most important market for travel between the US in terms of U UK travelers coming to the US and US demand wanting to go into the UK. So obviously the financial benefits, the commercial benefits, the jobs, there's probably about 300. It's not just the airlines, remember. These are the hotels, the service economy is all is all you know trying to get its business going again. New York could be a big boon for New York City, getting getting New York up and running. So it's really important strategically. But the other benefit, Richard, is that we're going to also then show other countries the avenue how to do this. And how do you do it? Well, you do it through making certain you've got a good testing uh, protocol, that you're monitoring uh, the results, and we've been doing that. And you can then start to give people confidence to travel. How confident are you, you know, with experience, how confident are you that this can be put in place? And the same for the EU, where I know negotiations are taking place. How confident are you it can be put in place to rescue something of the summer? I'm not sure we're going to rescue something of the summer, but we need to get started this summer. Because the longer it takes to get started, the longer it's going to take to fully spool up. And there's lost jobs, lost opportunity, and there's impact to real lives and livelihoods here. In, in Ed Bastian's world, where is reopening international in terms of importance? It's, it's, this is all important, but pragmatically, I realize that the, the goal for us here is to have a good summer to get the, in the U.S., to get the, the travel, get, get our business back, get U.S. travelers comfortable with traveling again. We're going to learn 
about the how to reopen borders internationally through corridors in the UK, through maybe some markets in Europe, certainly along the Mediterranean. There's a, there's a lot of interest in, in the U.S. travelers coming to visit. Asia, on the other hand, is probably next year. Really? Yeah. I think so. I think so. I, I, ho I hope I'm wrong, but I think it's going to take quite a while. When you think about the vaccination rates in, in many of the Asian countries are in the low single digits. And the, the size of the population and the confidence to open up borders to travel, I think it's going to take some time. My, my view, Richard, is you're going to see the summer of domestic travel in the U.S. is going to be gangbusters. People are just dying to get somewhere. But I don't think they're dying to go to Europe. I think they're just dying to go anywhere. And they're going to go someplace they feel confident getting to and easy to get to. Summer of 22, I think you're going to see the same phenomena on international travel. As you spool up and, uh, and as you get ready, what's your big concern? Biggest concern right now is, is getting all the employees, not just of our company, because we have our employees there, but all the service contractors. The service workers in the hospitality sector in the U.S. are straining for workers. But we're, we're doing what we have to do. We're having to pay bonuses to bring people in. We're, we're making certain that we've got the arrangements, because we're going to serve the summer travel. And, and the second thing to the, to the challenge is, you know, we've been down for about a year now. As you start to turn this big machine on, it takes some time and it's going to take it's going to get a little it's going to be a little creaky for a while to go from load factors of 40 to 50 percent to 80 to 90 percent almost overnight do you from your experience do you think that the various unemployment measures put in place insurance measures put in place has had an effect in the sense of the, the argument it's better to stay on it's you, you can earn as much by staying unemployed as you can by going back to work at the moment it's had an impact on some people I wouldn't go so far to say Do you think it's that's, overstated I think it's overstated I, I think people have moved I think people are not sitting here waiting for it for a job they don't know what it's going to return to it's going to take some time it's really only been about 60 days that we have seen vaccination rates occur and it's going to take some time so I think it's it's unfair to criticize people, you know, there's, there's almost implications that people are lazy or taking them. I don't believe that at all. You have built an airline based on formulae and uh, mathematics that says yield management, we sell this number of seats in, to the business traveler at this price and we'll sell this much and this much. The whole re re revenue management, it's going out the window. Well, You're going to have, sir? It's coming back, but yeah, it's been out the window. Yeah. How are you going to manage that? Well, we are managing that. We got to get the loads back first. You know, until you get to the point where you have a full plane, you can't practically manage the revenue buckets on board the plane. You know, right now we're just trying to figure out how to get people back into travel. This summer, we'll finally be able to start managing prices and revenue manage the uh, the individual discrete buckets, and as well, you know, make room for new segments because business travel this summer is not going to be as strong as it would have been. Leisure travel is going to be much stronger, and there's going to be another a new segment in there of kind of premium leisure that Delta is going to be very focused on. Premium leisure. Now, this is basically finding a price between the normal business class fare and a premium economy or fare that will allow you to extract higher revenue from w wealthier passengers to put them at the front. That's right. Yeah. My premise going through the pandemic is that customers, when they start to feel confident traveling, are going to pay a premium for the service above and beyond what they've paid in the past for those airlines that they feel are safeguarding their safety, their health, cleanliness on board the cabin. They have a brand attached to it. That's where we're going after. Do you see a fundamental shift in the pricing structure? I don't see a fundamental shift. I see a changing mix. Uh, I think the corporate travel that was here in 2019 is not going to return at the same level. I think a lot of it will return. I think there will be a different mix of travel. I think people will be traveling for different reasons. Many people have left the cities. They've moved to Florida. They've moved to the mountains. They're not coming back to the cities, but they're going to have different reasons why they travel. And so I, th I think you're going to see a, probably about 25% of the face of business travel is going to be different. I think it's going to come back, by the way. I just think it's going to be different. You spoke at my producer's daughter's graduation recently. Yeah. And you said, crisis doesn't form character, it reveals it. It does. 
So what did this crisis reveal about your leadership? Well, again, I don't like to talk about myself, as you know, personally. <laughs> Uh, but I, well, OK, I'll, I'll give you another quote from that, spe from that graduation speech. You said, it, you said real leadership is about inner confidence. Yeah. Now, is that what it revealed to you, your inner confidence? Uh, and I also said a fearlessness. And so fearlessness, it's a quiet confidence. Not, it's not boastful. You know, it's humble. It re it realize, you realize that you have to take people with you, that you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with. And, but there has to also be a confidence that the leader has in the team and themselves to be able to succeed because if you don't have that confidence and that confidence is gained by experience it's not something you can just buy off the shelf you're not going to be able to attract followership and we have great followership in this company uh, people love working for this company and the culture of the company is what sets us apart and it attracts customers and it attracts premium customers and it attracts international partners and if you look back at the last year was there a moment that you remember where you thought you know, is there a moment of the worst point of the crisis that you think? I say, uh, yeah, March of 2020, uh, mid-March, when things just seemed like they were spiraling out of control, our borders were being shut down, our traffic was going away. We had no idea what we were dealing with, and we didn't know whether we'd ever come back. Really? Yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, listen, we take for granted now that we have vaccinations. Remember 12 months ago, and there were people didn't even know what they were dealing with. So the notion that we could be back up in running within 15 months of the crisis starting, I think, was inconceivable, at least to me.